Thank you for joining us this evening for our third Race in the Law session. My name is Georgette Vigil. I am the Senior Director for Alumni Engagement and Outreach. A few items to note. Your Zoom screen name should be listed as your first and last name. If it isn't, please update your profile name in video settings. Your first and last name allows us to identify you so that you receive credit for your CLE affidavit. You are invited to introduce yourself using the chat function by typing in your full name, grad year, and where you work. This meeting is interactive and following the Q&A, you will be randomly assigned groups to discuss the topics outlined in your program at cu.law slash program. You can chat your questions privately to me using the chat function during the presentation. Professor Violette Chapin will respond to questions following the presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the Dean of Colorado Law. Dean Anaya is an internationally recognized scholar and author in international human rights is and issues concerning indigenous peoples. He served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2008 to 2014. In addition to his teaching and scholarship, Dean Anaya has litigated major cases involving indigenous peoples, human rights, and domestic and international tribunals. Please join me in welcoming Dean Anaya. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, this is truly a, an extraordinary and challenging time we're living in. And on top of everything, we, we have the lingering uncertainty of a highly charged presidential election. Hopefully we'll have a, a result soon. In the meantime, we're happy that you're joining us uh, for a lecture and discussion in our Race in the Law series featuring Professor Violeta Chapin. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize that the University of Colorado sits upon land within the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho territories. Further, we acknowledge that 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. The Race and the Law lecture series is part of Colorado Law's Anti-Racism and Representation Initiative, which we launched last, this last July. Um, an overarching goal of the initiative is to enhance opportunities for learning and reflecting on racism and its effects and, and on what each of us can do to work to defeat it as lawyers or future lawyers and citizens. And we're pursuing this goal in part through this lecture series. Other overarching goals of the initiative are to expand the law school's role as a catalyst for direct action to combat racism and its manifestations around us and to enhance the representation and inclusion of people of color and others from marginalized groups within our law school and the legal profession. If you're interested in learning more about the initiative and our progress with it, I encourage you to take a look at our website at colorado.edu slash law. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Violeta Chapin, who will be speaking on when cruelty becomes ordinary. Professor Chapin joined the Colorado Law faculty in 2009 and serves as the director of the Criminal and Immigration Defense Clinic. In her clinic, she has worked with students uh, to defend clients in both state and federal court on criminal and immigration matters and to litigate petitions for DACA status, naturalization applications, and, and motions to vacate criminal convictions because of a lack of legal advice about immigration consequences. Before joining Colorado Law, she served as a trial attorney with the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. She's also done work with the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, and assisted incarcerated youth in Louisiana. You can find more, uh, find out more about Professor Chapin's impressive background and the detailed biography that's been made available to you. I'm now delighted to turn the program over to Violeta. Thank you, Dean Anaya, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us here tonight. I am going to share my screen so that you can see.
what I am looking at. Good evening, everyone. My name is Violeta Chapin and I teach the Criminal and Immigration Defense Clinic at the University of Colorado Law School. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about race and the law. But before we get started, I would like to take the opportunity to share with you a little bit about our clinical programs at CU. We have nine live client clinical programs that allow students while they're still in law school to get out of the classroom and into the courtroom. It allows students to get next to clients, to witness injustice and to try to do something about it. Like Dean Anaya said, students in my clinic represent non-citizens in a variety of different legal matters. We have helped hundreds of DACA recipients in the state of Colorado to renew their immigration benefits. We represent non-citizens charged with misdemeanor offenses in state criminal court to try and avoid unnecessary consequences in their immigration cases. And we also represent asylum seekers, women and children who are fleeing violence in their native countries here in the United States. Thanks to all of you for joining us here tonight. We are truly living in extraordinary times. Today, is an extraordinary day as we find ourselves locked in a very tight election contest. And as I just saw on the headline that the United States topped more than 100,000 coronavirus cases in a single day. But tonight I want to talk to you about three things, three facets of our society that Americans have come to see as ordinary. Juvenile prisons, the death penalty, and the detention of immigrants. As a lawyer, I have witnessed extraordinary cruelty, extraordinary injustice in all three of these places. Yet most of America continues to accept their existence as just another part of our lives. How has this come to be? How did we get here? In this country, I believe that we must accept that we have a deep rooted problem with prejudice, punishment, and power. But we don't have to. I believe that we can do better, that if we have hard conversations, that we can find common ground and better solutions. Let's talk first about our juvenile prisons. In the summer of 2000, I was 25 years old and I had just finished my first year in law school. I traveled to New Orleans to work as a law clerk for the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana, an organization dedicated to protecting and advocating for kids who had been locked up in juvenile prisons across the state. The summer before I got there, the state of Louisiana had entered into a consent decree with the Justice Department after there had been findings of rampant physical and sexual abuse of the children detained in their facilities. In particular, there was one prison in Baton Rouge that had been using a steel cage for punishment. We learned that this cage was put in the middle of the yard where it would get really hot in the Louisiana sun. And if a child in the facility acted out, they could be sent to either sit or crouch in the cage because it was certainly too small for anyone to be able to stand up in. The Juvenile Justice Project had been charged with monitoring the state's compliance with the terms of this consent decree, which included abolishing that cage. So one day, myself and my fellow legal intern drove to Baton Rouge to interview the warden. We parked in the lot, got out of the car, and as we approached the prison, we could see glinting in the summer sun that hot metal cage. That interview with the warden in the summer of 2000 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana was one of the hardest I've ever had. And it taught me that power, when it is corrupt, can greatly affect punishment. And if the person wielding power is prejudiced, then who suffers is us. It is that child, it is his family, it is our community. 
It was three years after I graduated from law school that the Supreme Court of the United States finally outlawed the juvenile death penalty. In 2005, we finally abolished the juvenile death penalty in a case called Roper versus Simmons at the United States Supreme Court. We'll come back to the juvenile death penalty later on, but while that had been abolished, it was still possible for a child to be sentenced to spend the rest of their lives in prison if they were sentenced to juvenile life without parole or J. L. Lop. Seven years later, the Supreme Court abolished life without parole sentences for children convicted of non-homicide crimes. Despite piles of research around adolescent brain development showing that children fail to appreciate long-term consequences in the same way that adults do, we had for years decided that rehabilitation was no longer possible for certain children, primarily black and brown children. So J. Lop was dramatically reduced and that was a good development. In homicide cases, J. Lop sentence are, sentences are still possible, but they can no longer be mandatory after the decision in Miller versus Alabama. In other words, judges must take into account the rehabilitative potential of each child. This has also helped to drop the number of children serving life sentences in America. But today, as we sit here together, there are still approximately 2,570 children serving life sentences without the possibility of parole in our prisons. Racial disparities in the juvenile system are well documented over several decades in America. Studies from the 1980s and 90s demonstrated that black juveniles were detained and confined at much higher rates compared with white juveniles and that black youth were more likely to be sent to correctional facilities compared with white youth who were more likely to be sent to psychiatric hospitals. We also know that in juvenile sentencing, it is the race of the victim that determines the severity of the sentence. Most black youth charged with homicide are convicted of murdering black victims. It is a relatively small percentage of black children that are charged with killing white victims. But of those that are convicted of that offense, 43% of them are sentenced to life without parole. White children convicted of killing black victims are far less likely to be sentenced to the rest of their lives in prison. The good news is that there has been some movement in states that care to change this, to think of other ways that we might treat our young people, focusing on community-based alternatives and away from prisons. Here in Colorado, our legislature passed a juvenile justice reform bill in May of last year. This reform bill means that we value rehabilitation over punishment when it comes to kids, that we want to and can find community-based alternatives that will support the child and their family. It's not perfect, but it is a start. I believe that we can continue in this country to reassess prejudice, punishment and power when we are deciding how we want to treat the youngest among us. Now let's talk about the juvenile death penalty, about the death penalty, I'm sorry, just the death penalty, although it does involve a juvenile. Remember that I told you that we would come back to this. In 1944, George Stinney, age 14, was executed by the state of South Carolina after he was convicted of murdering two little white girls. His entire trial had taken just one day and he was executed within four months of his arrest. His parents were only allowed to visit him one time between the time he was arrested and before he was killed by the state of South Carolina. Years after George Stinney was executed, the entire proceedings were vacated when a court ruled that he had not received a fair trial. 
My third year in law school, I believed that I might want to be a death penalty lawyer. So I enrolled in Professor Brian Stevenson's death penalty clinic. Some of you may have heard of Brian Stevenson. He represented a man named Walter McMillian, who's the man on the left side of the picture with his finger in the air. Walter McMillian is a black man who was wrongfully convicted of killing a white woman in Alabama in 1986. Brian, who's in this picture on the right with the black tie, was his lawyer. And he was able to free Mr. McMillian after he sat on death row for six years for a crime he did not commit. This was made into a movie last year called Just Mercy. I was personally delighted that Michael B. Jordan, who also played Killamonger in Black Panther, played Brian in the movie. If you haven't seen it, please do. It is devastating and beautiful all at once. Anyway, I loved Brian. I loved the clinic, but it also taught me that I did not want to be a death penalty lawyer. So I became a public defender in Washington, DC. I represented clients that the government was trying to deprive of their liberty for seven years before I was hired here at the law school to teach in the clinics. I love teaching and I love Colorado after now having been here for 11 years. But let's talk about the death penalty here in Colorado. When my family and I arrived in Colorado in 2009, there were three men sitting on Colorado's death row, Sir Mario Owens, Nathan Dunlap, and Robert Ray. All of them, as you can see, are Black. And another interesting commonality about all of them is that they had attended the same high school in Aurora, Colorado. The US Census Bureau tells us that in 2019, the total population of the state of Colorado was just shy of 6 million. It probably does not come as any surprise to any of you that our population here is overwhelmingly white and that our black population is very small, less than 5%. Yet for many years, the population of our death row in Colorado was 100% black. These are facts that should cause us to take a painfully hard look at what is going on. What role has power, punishment, and prejudice played? Studies have shown us for many decades that racial disparities exist in our application of the death penalty in America. While it is good news that the number of execution, executions in this country has steadily dropped over the last few decades, it is sadly a fact that when we look at who gets sentenced to death in America, we see again that it is the race of the victim that controls. Despite the sad fact that the majority of homicide victims in this country are black, it is only when a victim is white that the penalty is most often death. As you can see from the last bullet point, on this slide, 73% of the executions carried out in the United States in 2019 involved cases with white victims. I invite all of you to reflect on this further in small group discussion in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. I hope that one day I will witness the abolition of the death penalty in America. Here in Colorado, most of you may know that we abolished the death penalty in March of 2020, just a few months ago. We had executed just one person, Gary Davis, between 1975 and 2020. And a bipartisan bill to abolish something that we had come to realize we no longer had use for, that was no longer within our evolving standards of decency, was ended. 22 states in the US have abolished the death penalty. 22 legislatures with representatives elected by their constituents have decided that the death penalty cannot stand if we are to rethink 
and perhaps unlearn prejudice, punishment, and power. On this map, it is the states colored in light blue that have abolished the death penalty. The few dark blue states currently have a governor imposed moratorium on the death penalty so they can decide if they will get rid of it. And the remaining red states continue to allow for capital punishment. It is progress, incremental, but progress. And I am hopeful. Finally, let's talk about immigration detention in America. I remind my students all the time that our immigration legal system is a civil system, not a criminal system. The penalty for being in this country without proper immigration documents or status is removal or deportation, not prison. I have to remind them of that because it often looks and feels like a criminal system. Over the last decade, we have seen a dramatic change in who the people are that are arriving at our southern border. Instead of young single men looking for work, we have seen families, mothers and small children, many of them seeking asylum from violence and persecution at home. The fact that they are brown-skinned, Spanish-speaking immigrants is also part of this conversation. They come from a particular part of this world, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, El Salvador. El Salvador is the country from where my own mother is from. I know that the issue of how we as a country should handle this is deeply contested. And that is because it matters. It has real consequences on people's lives, on the lives of children and their families. And what we've done, unfortunately, over the last couple of years is put them in prison. In 2014, President Obama started a wide scale detention of immigrant families. The Secretary of Homeland Security at the time, Jay Johnson, announced that families would be detained together but nevertheless detained for as long as it took to complete their immigration cases and deport them. It was only when immigration lawyers filed lawsuits that a federal judge in California, Dolly Gee, made Obama stop doing it. President Trump has taken this policy one step further by arresting and criminally charging immigrant parents with the crime of unlawful entry which is a federal misdemeanor that's been on our books for many, many years. No president before Trump has made the decision to enforce that federal misdemeanor. We have for many decades criminalized unlawful re-entry. Indeed, it is the single most prosecuted federal crime in America for the last two decades. That is a charge that is given to immigrants who have been lawfully deported and have unlawfully re-entered the United States. But it is the Trump administration alone who has chosen to charge first time border crossers with the federal misdemeanor of unlawful entry. Once charged with a federal crime, the parents have to go into federal criminal detention and their children cannot go with them there. So the children are detained in different facilities. You see an example of one of those facilities right now on your screen. That is what has caused so many thousands of family separations. Lawyers for the Department of Homeland Security had to admit last month, October of 2020, that they simply cannot find the parents of 545 migrant children. What does immigration detention in America tell us about prejudice? punishment and power. There is hope. The Dream and Promise Act of 2019 is a bipartisan bill that is sitting before the Senate waiting to be called up for a vote. If it passes, it will normalize the status of thousands of immigrants brought to this country when they were small children. This bill 
and comprehensive immigration reform may or may not see the light of day after the last 24 hours. But I do believe that when it comes to immigration, we know that we can do better. I'll end by saying today feels like a day for inspirational quotes. And sometimes I need them when I get tired, when I feel like maybe I should just give up because it's all too much. One of my favorite people in the world, Jeff Schur, was the training director for the statewide public defender system in Kentucky for many years. And he introduced me to the concept of the different motivations of the public defender. We use them when we train public defenders through an amazing organization in Atlanta named Gideon's Promise that works to sustain public defenders in under-resourced offices across the country. There are many times when our lawyers feel that they can no longer continue to fight or to speak out against what feels like extraordinary cruelty and extraordinary injustice that they witness every day in our criminal and immigration legal systems. I'd like to go through these three motivations and I invite you to decide which one speaks to you, which one might sustain you when you feel challenged in your daily life and in the work that you do. The first is a quote from Sister Helen Prejean that says, people are more than the worst thing they've ever done. The second is from Nietzsche. Distrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. And the third, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. From Margaret Mead. Thank you to all of you for your time and attention tonight. I know that it was a particularly challenging day for many of us for a number of reasons, and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Violetta. Uh, it is uh, certainly nice to end with knowing that there are people like you who are committed to this work to make progress, to uh, benchmark and move forward so that these things don't can continue. Um, we uh, are open for questions. I want everybody, I know there, are, I was chatting with a few people. We have several folks who attend, have attended all of these sessions. Uh, this is our third session and it looks like we have our first question from Stephanie Gonzalez. She asks, what led to the change towards public defense instead of public penalty work? Well, so the Supreme Court decided in 1954 in Gideon versus Wainwright that anybody charged with a crime in the United States um, would have a lawyer would be represented by counsel. And, and it's a big deal for that to have happened. And it's, it's, it's a little alarming that it, it sort of seems so recent that for many, many years, we did not allow people to be represented by counsel uh, when they were facing a loss of liberty, right? And for any kind of crime sort of ranging from the lowest level misdemeanor to a very serious offense like homicide, uh, there wasn't for many, many years in this country, the right to have an attorney. Um, and I, this was litigated um, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and it took a tremendous fight and a battle for the Supreme Court to say that our constitution requires that in order for someone to be convicted and sent away to prison, they have the right to have an attorney. And if they cannot afford one, that we, the government will pay for one. And, and that's what, that's what sort of birthed the public defender system. Um, and, and I'm proud of us and grateful that we have public defenders in this country because they are the ones who are doing 
that intense and very difficult work of, of representing all of the people that our government sort of chooses to criminalize, right? And in this country, you know, we criminalize lots of things. And so there are many ways that people can be dragged into the criminal justice system and be forced to defend themselves. And, and we now do provide them with a lawyer that will stand next to them and will advocate for those rights. Um, it's not a perfect system. Certainly the public defender system has been left up to the states. And so there's been a sort of patchwork of, of different ways that the states have, have funded it. Um, and really, you know, people charged with crimes aren't the most sympathetic of people. And so a lot of states have sort of raced to the bottom to make that sort of a low budgetary issue. And that's what's resulted in, in many public defenders in different states being overwhelmed and having overwhelming caseloads. Um, and that's not their fault, right? That's they, I think so many people go to be public defenders because they want to stand next to those who are targeted by our criminal justice system and speak out and to defend them and to defend our constitution and their rights, but they do not have sufficient resources to be able to do that in the way that they would like to. My dream is that one day we will have a public defender for immigrants, <laughs> that we will provide lawyers at government expense to people that the government is trying to deport. Again, that doesn't happen uh, because it is a civil system and we have only provided lawyers for people who are in the criminal system. Um, and so it is, not, it is not yet that we have a Gideon's for immigrants, but I am hopeful uh, that one of these days we will because, because you know, lawyers, they don't solve every problem. But if you are in front of a judge uh, with a lawyer sitting across the way, um, trying to, to do things to you and to your family, such as deport you and remove you from a country that you've lived in for many years, I do believe that we as a society should provide them with counsel so that they are not forced to be there by themselves. Well, I hear your excitement and passion to help people. It's very inspiring. We have another question from, uh, our next question from Tim Monahan. Uh, what is the current status of the three people on death row in on, um, in Colorado, has the governor indicted uh, in, that he might intervene? So Governor Polis, when we, he signed the legislation abolishing the death penalty in March of this year, commuted all of the sentences of the three men on death row to life without parole. Um, so they are um, going at the moment uh, in prison for the rest of their lives. Um, it may be that there are clemency opportunities for them and clemency is an opportunity to apply um, here to the, directly to the governor again for, for mercy in, in your sentence. Um, and, and I'm proud to say that the, that the clemency board here in Colorado is, is alive and active and is committed to, to seeing whether or not we can reduce our prison population here in Colorado in, in a safe way, right? That takes into account the safety of the community, but also uh, families and people who are incarcerated who are serving tremendously long sentences uh, for crimes that were committed many, many years ago. Um, and the clemency initiative allows uh, people in prison to show evidence of rehabilitation since they've been in prison. You know, people go to prison and, and sometimes they, that's where they, they find, you know, their potential, right? They are given the opportunity to participate in programs and to do things that show that they are as as Sister Helen Prejean said, more than the worst thing that they've ever done. You know, I learned that from my clinical professor in law school, Brian Stevenson, who, who said that. He said that just because someone steals something doesn't mean that they are just a thief. Just because someone hurts someone, right, doesn't mean that they are just a criminal. They are sons, they are daughters, they are parents, they are you know, artists, they are, there are so many other things and it is the job of us as the lawyers to convey to the rest of society, the humanity, right, of their clients, the entire person of who it is that they are. Thank you for that question. And it looks like we lost Georgette um, so this is Yesenia. I'm going to read off the next question. 
provided by Professor Chen. Thanks for your remarks, especially around the notion of civil Gideon. Could you talk more about how having counsel impacts outcomes in immigration cases and about the various approaches towards providing counsel for immigrants? Uh, so for example, universal defense, removal defense versus carve outs for immigrants with criminal convictions. I believe RMIAN has been provided in these efforts for universal defense, which seems ambitious. <laughs> Thank you, Yefenia, for that question. Thank you, Professor Chen, for that question. Um, Remain is the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Network. They are in Westminster, Colorado. They're an amazing nonprofit organization here that uh, provides low cost and some no cost representation to immigrants that are in court. And they are doing their best to step in and try to provide legal representation to immigrants in removal proceedings. Um, they have uh, partnered with the city of Denver and Mayor Hancock to, to begin conversations around universal representation of immigrants in Colorado, um, which I think is a wonderful effort. Um, certainly, I, you know, I, best case scenario, the federal government, who is the people trying to deport immigrants in the United States should shoulder this bill, but in the me or should shoulder that, that cost and they should be the ones that are paying for the lawyers, but in the meantime, if the states can, if they have the ability and the will, they can step in and, and provide more than what the federal government does. And that would be lawyers for immigrants in removal proceedings. Um, there is one state uh, right now that has, uh, or one city really, New York City provides uh, universal representation for immigrants in removal proceedings in their jurisdiction. Um, and they have found that, that one sort of providing a lawyer to immigrants means that they will show up for court, right? Because they then believe that they will be able to litigate their claims um, and that it, that it really does sort of increase the efficiency of, of court proceedings. Certainly uh, in our experience in the clinic, we have represented immigrants that are detained at the detention facility in Aurora, Colorado in, in bond proceedings. And that's just sort of the initial proceeding to get them out of immigration detention. Um, and perhaps contrary to, to popular belief, the vast majority of immigrants that are detained on suspicion of an immigration violation are actually eligible for bond or eligible for release. We litigated 36 bond hearing cases in two years in the clinic and we won every single one. And that doesn't mean that we're just the best lawyers in the world, although we are awfully good, but it means that having a lawyer makes a difference, right? Having a lawyer to, to know what the legal standard is, to understand what the evidence is that has to be collected that corroborates your claims uh, to present to the judge is crucial in order at, at the very beginning of a case to make that huge decision about whether someone is detained in a prison or back at home with their families in order to try and litigate that case. And so providing immigrants to lawyers, you know, I mean, lawyers to immigrants um, drastically improves their chances of, of making a legal argument and winning that legal argument based on the laws that we already have. And so that alone, in my opinion, shows to me the necessity of having lawyers for immigrants and how that is truly, truly a duty that, that our federal government should certainly shoulder if we are going to have a fair and just immigration system. Um, and I certainly welcome efforts here in Colorado to step in when the federal government has not. So I, I'm back. I had some technical difficulties. It sounds like everything went off without a hitch. Uh, we have three more questions that are in the queue right now. Uh, Thank you, Yesenia, for asking everybody to repost their questions. You had a, a long list of questions, so I hope we are getting to all of them. Uh, the next question is, is from Yesenia. Uh, she is asking, are there any other countries that have well-functioning legal, uh, legal immigration system that the U.S. can learn lessons from? Well, of course, Yesenia asks me a hard question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I should know, and I apologize, but I will research that and get back to you. I think um, Professor Chen on the call might know the answer to that question. If she does, I would invite her to, to join us and let us know. 
Okay, we'll go on to the next question. And if Professor Chen has an answer to that, we'll have her uh, pop on. The next question is from Lori Capros. Uh, she asks, thank you for sharing the, your concept conceptualization of these clients. We need to abolish labels like thief and sex offender and murderer and criminal. Why, why would we call someone something we, we don't want them to be? Empirical research supports the notion that um, uh, redivism, if I could pronounce that, is reduced when we instead encourage people to build productive uh, pro-social lives instead of only fixating on the worst behaviors in perpetuity. So I guess that's more of a comment, but she's she's thanking you for that. Well, I certainly have a, have a comment to Lori's comment. Lori Kepros, it's nice to see you here. Thank you for that comment. I 100% agree, you know, it gets back to that concept of, of recognizing and agreeing as a society. I think if we can start at a base level and agree that all of us are more than the worst thing we've ever done, then we should certainly be able to define ourselves and each other um, by all of those myriad things, um, including sort of the, the good, bad, and the complicated. Um, I agree with you that one of the huge problems confronting this country is the high rate of recidivism. <laughs> That's how you say it, Georgia. Thank recidivism you. Is, is, is what we have here in America as a result of having tremendously sort of poorly constructed, poorly designed and poorly managed prisons um, that do not focus on rehabilitation or on reintroducing people back into society when they are released. And so unfortunately what happens in these extraordinarily dangerous and violent prisons that we operate here in the United States is that, is that people become socialized to be in prison. Uh, they, they, they do not develop good habits for returning back to society. And then we as a society also keep them out of the workforce, right? By making people with felony convictions sort of unable to get employed when they leave prison. And that then means that the vast majority of people who get out of prison go back, right? And that's the recidivism rate. That is not a good outcome. It is not a sustainable outcome for us as a society. And I think what it reflects is a is a desire to focus only on sort of short-term punishment and to not think about the long-term consequences of incarcerating people for a very long time in a dangerous place and not setting them up to re-enter society. Because the truth of the matter is, is that the vast majority of people that are going to prison or jail are getting out, right? A small percentage of people going to prison or jail are either on death row or serving life without parole sentences, which is good, right, I suppose. But, but it means that the vast majority of people are going to get out and our prison system as it does and these labels that we attach to people, as Lori says, right, calling them a criminal or a thief or a murderer, right? We don't allow them to, to move out from under that. We, 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 we choose to identify them that as that, to incarcerate them for many, many years and to forget about thinking about them for many, many years until they get out and then we give them no opportunity to succeed. And, and that is not the way that I believe a just um, and humane society should operate. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, but uh, Jim, um, Dean and Naya, do you want to, Dean has the example of uh, other countries that we could model. Do you wanna hop in and, and let us know about Canada? No, just to just to just to mention Canada as, as a as a country with a pretty progressive immigration system that seems to work, and they not only are fairly liberal um, in their immigration policies historically, but it's also they also provide significant support uh, to, to to immigrants. So I mean, it's a small country; it's a different um, context, one could argue, but uh, I, I think sufficiently similar. And one, one could also argue that, that, that they would be under more of a, of a threat of the kind of uh, 
problems that uh, those who want, argue for a more restrictive immigration policy uh, would are, would um, would want. So, great. Thank you for that. Thank okay. you. I, I I'll jump in just to say that yes. Thank you for that. I have um, heard about Canada um, having a sort of a more sort of easy to navigate immigration system than we have. Our immigration system is hopelessly complicated and it takes years and years and years and it's super backlogged. Um, Canada has streamlined it much more. They also, as I think Jim was referencing, have more support for refugees and asylum uh, recipients who are there in terms of uh, supporting them and integrating them into society. That is certainly one thing that I think we could do a better job of here with our um, immigrant communities to sort of open ourselves up to 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 have more sort of refugee um, entry agencies that support immigrants when they are here to adapt to American society, which is, you know, its own thing. And so um, I certainly think that there are ways that we could look at other countries and see sort of the ways that they have streamlined the process um, and made it more easy to navigate um, and, and to make people feel like like they are welcome. You know, Ming Chen just published a book, um, Pursuing Citizenship in the Enforcement Era, which is all about how it is that we as a country sort of make people feel like they are welcome so that when they apply for citizenship, right, to become members, like full joined members, that they do so because they want to join us as opposed to feeling afraid, right? And thinking, oh, at this moment, immigrants are under attack. So perhaps now is the moment to naturalize so that I'm safe, right? And, I, and it's such an interesting concept. I highly recommend the book to all of you so that you think about, it's such an interesting way to think about sort of who we wanna be as a society, right? Do we want people to join our team because they like us? Or do we want people to join our team because they're afraid of us, right? That, that's, that, is, that is not what I would like uh, as a society. And so um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good opportunity for all of us to think about how we can look to, to other countries to see what they have done and, and to think about how we can be better. Excellent. Our next question is from Isabel DeCampo. In your experience, how effect effective have efforts of nonprofit organizations who provide legal representation uh, who provide legal representation to immigrants? And how can we change public policy by involving citizens? Thank you, Isabel, for that question. Um, so there are a number of very high-performing, well-funded nonprofit advocacy organizations across the country. Um, and, you know, states like California have many of them, right, because they're huge. I, I certainly wish that we had more here in Colorado. Um, the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Organization or network in, in Westminster is doing a, a good job, you know, but sort of the issue that confronts a lot of nonprofit agencies is that they just simply don't have the funding or the capacity to take everybody who needs help. Um, we have a new growing organization in Fort Collins called Alianza Norco, which I have just uh, learned about, which is wonderful. We have a, an organization here in Longmont called Philanthropies in Colorado that does a lot of advocacy and, and, and sort of crowdsource funding around um, immigrant initiatives, which is great. Um, but it's never enough, right? The need is, is tremendous. And I think that the best thing that we can do as citizens is to say that we are, that we are allies, right? And that we are, are here uh, to support all members of our community, regardless of their immigration status. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, that one of the best things that I've been able to do at CU over the last few years is to interact with our undocumented students at CU Boulder. Um, most of them have, have DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, some of them do not. And it's been wonderful to see the university really step up and support them. Um, and in fact, you know, there's a CU Student Relief Fund that citizens are able to, or anyone really, quite frankly, is able to donate to in order to be able to support undocumented students who do not have access to federal financial aid, even if they have DACA. And so if they have sort of financial needs, they can turn now to this relief fund. And, and that is a real tangible way uh, that people uh, can help in this community. I can certainly say that Boulder 
county uh, and the citizens that live here have been tremendously supportive of our efforts to help people renew their DACA and they have donated um, amazing amounts of money and I'm so grateful to the Boulder Community Foundation um, for them to give us grants to help people pay the fee, the $495 fee that it costs to renew their DACA. So there, there are a lot of ways that I think uh, people can support both financially, but also I think engaging in these really difficult conversations, right? With people in their family, with their friends who perhaps may not agree with them um, or who perhaps may just have a lot of questions around sort of immigrant justice, criminal justice, racial justice here in America. Right? If, if we're not gonna, if we're gonna talk about it ever, I feel like right now is the time to do it. Thank you so much, Violetta, for this eye-opening presentation. I imagine your presentation has prompted, uh, prompted us for meaningful dialogue in our breakout uh, groups. By the end of the week, everyone will receive a link to the presentation and a survey to share your thoughts with us. And Colorado attorneys will receive a link for the, for the CLE affidavit, affidavit. Before you were sent to breakouts, I'd like to announce that as part of our anti-racism and representation initiative, our next session is December 4th. And we're doing a lunchtime session from 1130 to 1245, Race in the Law, Race, and the Constitution presented by Professor Helen Norton. Stay, into, stay tuned for further information on this. Uh, now, we're all gonna go to breakout sessions. Now, please note, you have to accept the prompt or else you'll be in a room by yourself um, wondering where everybody is. So you need to press the prompt. Uh, you'll be moved into the breakout session and you're referring to your program for the, uh, the questions uh, that are there for your discussion groups. Uh, please note that you'll receive a two minute warning when the breakouts are coming to a conclusion and the interactive session is complete. So please enjoy your 15 minute uh, breakout session. Thank you so much.